just just so you know what the order of things and perhaps uh, you know where things are going, just in case it's not clear up there, we're going to, uh, Krista's going to put the stone in the middle and second we'll do a circle. Yeah, um, I'll just put the stone in the middle and then who wants to grab it and go first and then start off with sharing their positive affirmation, teaching, um, you know, words, special word they put up there, and maybe if you want to co comment to that, to, you know. Good afternoon. Um, my leaf up there says, value one another and our work. And um, I guess it's sort of in response to, well, all of us being here and sharing this time together. Um, but also, uh, a, a little bit of our conversation has about how to evaluate our work. And I want to change the, the language and say, rather than evaluating, we want to value it. And so, you know, to stop that sort of the scientific, the numbers sort of mindset, trying to take over and colonize our our way of doing this work. So rather than evaluating it, let's value it. Uh, the word I put up there is akichita, or akichita, uh, if you take a look, it's uh, the one that's written right there. Uh, in Nakota and Nakota language, we, the way it was explained to me, and I always seen it written in books when they say akichita, it says warrior. There's no term in our language that says that, that I can remember hearing. There's no such thing as somebody who goes out and makes war. What it translates to me and what I was told to by my mom, um, she said it was protector. That's what they do. Akitsutao or Okitsutao in the Cree language or even in Anishinaabe Okitsutao, they're protectors. And what they do is, is they make sure knowledge and everybody in the band was protected. That's what I was translated as. I'm only coming from my family's perspective. I'm not speaking for all the Nakota or Dakota people. I'm not speaking for all the Nehewa people. But the way it was disseminated to me, if you want to say disseminated, the way I was um, raised is to protect. And when I heard uh, so many things throughout the conference and everything, um, to me it's just I look around the room and I think of the translation of the, even the Cree word, it means big hearted people, the ones with the strongest hearts. That's what it means. And so when I see people at least trying in education or in higher education institutions, trying to help the indigenous people, the original, if you want to say, from in, in the land, that's probably what I was getting at. Um, I get, um, you can get into arguments about semantics or whatever, but Akitsita just means protector. And this is what I like to think that you were all doing here, trying to help and protect. Because for so long, I can only speak for myself again, uh, as such a young um, man, indigenous person, I watched a lot of the um, atrocities happen. I say atrocities because we were doing it to ourselves. And I always ask that question of myself, like, why am I here? Why was I placed here? Why was I asked to be here? And why did I even survive the stuff that I went through? Um, and listening to the presentation this morning, I wanted to ask, well, those men out there too that are hurting, and I know. And that's why they do what they do. And so I think to myself, well, we need to put that concept back to where what it really belongs. I guess the, the translation is so hard and into English, such a coarse and rough language, the English language. I can't really tell you what it truly means. But to me, it's the embodiment of protection. That's what it was supposed to do. So that's why I put it up on the lead. So anyway, next day. So thank you for the gift of all of your stories. They have been woven into who I am and who I'm becoming. And the words I wrote are, sometimes a person needs a story more than food to stay alive by Barry Lopez. Um, I was very enthusiastic about putting the leaf on. And then when I reached there, I really could not find the words to express myself. So instead, I went um, outside and took some pictures of the beautiful fall leaves. And um, I, I, I get drawn to trees a lot. And um, I think um, what I got also got from the video was uh, <coughs> there was a lot of strength in the people or the women who were sharing their stories, um, although they have gone through different things, hardships. But what came out very, very clear was how strong they were. And I think uh, that is something I'll take with me. Uh, the leaf 
my phrase on the leaf I put on the tree is arts for social transformation. And I think the challenge is for us to think about how we can do social transformation on an individual basis, but also how we can use the arts to do social transformation on a systemic basis. I wrote, I wrote the hands master what the mind wrestles with. Uh, we learn by doing. I wrote a call to <coughs> gift uh, I've been given. Uh, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Respect. I wrote from tolerance, which doesn't sound too good if I say, well, I'll tolerate you, to acceptance, which is the harder part of the journey. Uh, I could have wrote regret. Um, I missed your piece, and I deeply regret that because of all the introductions I've heard this weekend, um, yours to me was, was very moving and profound and uh, showed a lot of embodied courage and, and wisdom. So. Um, I'm going to follow up to find out where I can find that movie and talk with you. Uh, I wrote, um, Be the Change You Want to See. And, and I think uh, that just reminds me that um, the work that we do is work. It's not something that we do out there. It really needs to be something we do in here. I can't remember exactly what I wrote, but it had the word resistance in it. And. Um, <laughs> Part of the reason I wanted to write that is because in the course of this weekend, um, I've really had my thinking shifted. I think it started with resistance is sexy. But um, because I've always thought about the limitations of resistance as a reaction, as not necessarily starting from a place of agency, but responding to an external stimulus. And, and I think I was, I'm, I was wrong about that, that, that resistance can begin from a place of strength. Um, and I think I really felt that with the film. Um, the, the film to me was dem a demonstration of affirmation and strength um, that certainly takes into account systemic structures and oppression, but doesn't begin from those places. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm grateful for, for um, I think, that better way of understanding. Um, the words I wrote up there were in response to the film, but also kind of incorporating some of the other magic that happened today. Um, so I wrote, um, interactive reciprocity creates positive energy flow. Well, I didn't write anything <coughs> on the tree either. Um, but, I, but I keep coming back to uh, these words, which are, my body is the pivot of the world which is something that um, Merleau-Ponty wrote, actually. Phenomenal, just French dude. Um, but I think they're great words. Um, I wrote Supreme Courage up there, and um, I was just moved by um, the courage, the role modeling of all of the women in the video, and Christo, by you standing up and sharing that with us, and your courage and your role modeling I'll carry with me. Just your words, but the, the need to restore respect to our women. And I think drawing on your the power that came from your storytelling and the stories of the other women, I put a portion of a quotation Brother Blue, who was a master storyteller down in the States, and basically spent most of his life standing on corners and telling stories and bringing stories um, to people for individual and social change. And he says that enough fleas can move an elephant. Storytelling can change the world. I don't remember exactly how he worded it. But uh, sentiment is uh, you know, very struck by the historical context at the beginning of your film. And um, the idea that, I think I said we can change the course of history, but maybe it should be we are changing the course of history. <coughs> I also don't have a leaf up there, but I am um, reflecting on it. I find it's a really inspiring um, offering to us and to the community, and to your community, I think, as you say, you're bringing it there. It's really great work. <laughs>
<laughs> something that's rattling around in my brain right now is a, is a quote that I read many years ago. And I think it's very, it, for me, it resonates in this moment. And it is this. There are two questions we must ask ourselves. Where am I going and who will go with me? And heaven help us if we ask them in the wrong order. Uh, I don't have anything up there and, and uh, I guess I must have missed the boat, but what else is new? Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> 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 I know, this is taking off the know, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> he sure didn't miss the boat, did he? <laughs> um, I think I actually, when I, um, after watching the video, I went up and I uh, gave uh, Chris a hug and I, I said something to her and what I said to her is I said, you know, I said, you are fantastic and I said, uh, I love the term or the name, uh, um, you know, positive, um, I can't even think right now, positive, positive Aboriginal women. Positive Aboriginal women. And, and I love that. And I, you know, but I said to her, why does it take um, an atrocity or a situation like this for something to take place in our community and with our women for it to be on national stage? Um, these Aboriginal people have been dealing with these issues, and maybe not HIV, but you know, with uh, um, atrocities for hundreds of years, and we have still yet to deal with it. And it's very unfortunate that this has to bring it to light for you know, for um, I guess the, the the powers that be or the non-Aboriginal people or part of society to actually recognize that uh, we we have positive female leaders. Um, we have positive male leaders, and then as we are all working with you. So that was one of my comments to, to you. And I want to go back to what you said about arts-based will help with transformation. You made that comment. And something that I, I noticed in the last, in th this weekend, um, I work in a classroom every day with children. You know, grade four right now, but I've had the opportunity to work with our youth. And, um, I feel I'm truly blessed because working with those children every day, I see the, the, the ability to use arts and to use history and to use many other, other ways and means of uh, seeing the transformation and the social justice take place. So. I wrote two things. I wrote, one was um, Indigenous peoples are not risky. And I, I think if anything we're getting from this weekend, we need to stop saying that. You need to stop profiting off of that. You need to stop using that in your research. If you're like, what do I do then? We have to make our jobs not based on this industry of indigenous trauma. We're not here for, to make people have jobs, get research grants through our pain and through our sorrow. If you want to be allies with us, you need to be in solidarity with us to actually transform and change things. And I think that's what my sister Krista always reminds me of, and especially that video, you know, at the end when Dora says, we're still here, we're, we're not here for career making and we're not here for profiting. And I think especially our stories and our ancestors are not here for that. You can say what puts our lives at risk, but you need to stop saying that we're risky. We're not risky all by ourselves. And especially our young people are not risky. The other thing I said was, um, we need to not just decolonize, we need to indigenize. And we, talk, we are talking about that in my community right now, about the focus on decolonization is, is really important. But if we're not indigenizing what we're doing, then we're going to recolonize ourselves constantly throughout the process. And so it's not just about undoing colonialism, because the other part of resistance is reclamation and restoration. Thank you. <coughs> I put up there changing stories that we have the power to change the direction of our story. You know, when I grew up as an inner city kid, you know, always believing these labels and these things, you know, that society imposed upon me as a young person. And yeah, I did, you know, find myself in, in that um, in that story that was told about us. <laughs> you know? Um, but anyhow, I've, I've far come to uh, you know, an, another stage of um, transformation in my life with, with the help of my community and the healing 
and the kinship <coughs> that exists in my community, you know, to have the, you know, have the power to claim, you know, claim my story, know that it's my story and you can't go and tell me what's going to be in my story, you can't tell me I'm this, I'm that, because I'm not none of that anymore, I never was none of that in the first place, you know, I, I'm this, this is who I am and this is my story and, you know, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to share, you know, and that's the thing about this language and everything about the way that our people are viewed and all the deficit part of us, you know. Um, I, that's why I just want to share about, uh, you know, when we, when, we're, when we are given an opportunity to have an experience much like the ones I have, you know, I've changed, I changed the story. I changed the story of my kids being words of the government. I changed the story that I'm dying, I'm living. I look good doing it. I don't 
feel safe in getting in any of your books. <laughs> or your canoes, or whatever you call them. Well, if you follow the rules, I can let you use my paddle. If you follow my rules. My rules. But you haven't told us what my the rules are yet. What are we going to Well, you should have known for coming. You should know. genocide of a whole community is the big elephant in the room and it's hard to talk about it and it's a big silence. And so sometimes playback can help just at least why are we silent and why is it hard for us to feel safe to talk about what everyone's talking about privately. <coughs> yes. I just want to make an observation and I'm just aware of something right now. And that is that very often we talk about things. And uh, earlier on this weekend, somebody made a comment about smudging, and mm -hmm. uh, people talked about it a little bit, but now we have that odor here. Just take a moment and get the sense, the scent of that. Take it in. You can't <coughs> explain that. that observation for yourself when something that gets talked about actually gets put into the room and you feel it and you sense it? What does it feel like for you when that comes into the room? Again, we're trying to put something <coughs> that works that is part of my personal language. And that odor comes to me. <coughs> ah. We're going to reflect it back to you in our way. Yes. Using playback, so to do a fluid sculpture, a sense of release when something that's unexplainable gets felt and experienced by everyone. Let's watch.
just our reflection for you. It could have exactly said what you said, wanted to say, or could have just been another reflection. How is that for you, just to see that reflected? Did anyone resonate with some of the themes or metaphors that anyone want, might want to share how they're feeling <coughs> around the issues that we were talking about? Oh, I think big time, it's all about agenda, deliverables, due dates, blah, 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 going to community, doing all this good work, but yet we can't break it down to embody the whole, you know, part of the experience and, you know, being a part with the people, like you can always do work for people or whatever, but you have to go, like, go right in, you know, like, you can't be resistant to not want to smell the smudge or be a part of those sacred teachings when you go into these communities, those are... Those are the way of the people. It's to be, you know, like I heard one sister say before, um, you know, um, when you go to other places, like you go visit the Pope, well, you do what the Pope does. You go visit Africa, well, you go do what the Africans do. You come visit us in our homelands, well, you know, with the agendas and all those, those become the barriers from really making that true connection and really <laughs> delivering that real quality, what you're trying to get at? Just two <coughs> things going on. One is the agendas, these deliverables, these barriers, and then there's this, how do we connect to the community Just and be with the people that you're with, the indigenous community that you're, you're working with? And I sometimes feel like maybe this is a conflict that people experience. It's like they have this agenda deliverables, they have this funding that got you into the community to do this work, but it stops you from actually just being with the community and just being present and being the way <coughs> connecting. Is that does that sound like something you want to see? We're gonna see this as a pair. Yeah. Well, on the one hand you have deliverables, things that and then and on the other hand <coughs> on the other hand <coughs> is trying to connect to the community and be and be there. Got to get going. I've got to roll. Got to roll the play. Got to plan. Got to write reports. Yeah. Get on with it. Yeah. I see. Come on, come on. You want me to sit here? No, no. You've got to do this. Uh, I'm going to do a circle. No, no, no. I've got to listen to the prayer. <laughs> no, the, the drummers. <laughs> Oh, I'll find another research I'm assistant. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you can't do that. You gotta write your report. Get back I to the to office. I have to sit in the circle. I have to sit in the circle. We're not doing this properly. Okay. Let's start. Responding to a distant power. And the people who set those criteria are not there. They're absent. In some sense, that researcher, that practitioner, is anticipating what that distant power is likely to say and trying to act in order to satisfy that person. And in doing so, is becoming disconnected from the ideal of what I am doing here is a joining with this, with this people, with this group, with this community. And which do I choose to serve? Which do I choose to join with? Which do I choose to take my direction from? You know, the people that are right here who I can engage with, who I can speak to, or this distant, disembodied voice that it would be very difficult for me to reach. Part of me here of, of the little skit is, um, it, it, first it makes the assumption that the researcher is not Aboriginal, that the research mm -hmm. assistant is not Aboriginal, mm -hmm. which brings to me the, the part of the problem is that in an Aboriginal conference on arts-based research, why would you not have an Aboriginal researcher, a research assistant, or a community research mentor in the process so that these types of things do not happen to begin with. 
And I think that there are now an emergent group of Aboriginal scholars who are willing to partner with and ally with and support non-Aboriginal partnerships. And often we do not have access to the grant dollars. So um, sometimes those partnerships and allies can be a win-win on, on both ends. But I just find um, par partly maybe what's playing out at this conference as well is that the voice of the non-Aboriginal researcher is the louder voice here and the Aboriginal researchers um, are quite silent. And I don't really need to see it embodied, I live it, so I don't need to see it played back, but it, it definitely is um, apparent to me. Uh, as you had mentioned, the smell of the, you know, of the sage, or sweetgrass over there, and then when you guys did the playback, uh, I guess to be perfectly honest with you, I felt extremely insulted. Uh, the dramatization, the to me, it was almost a mockery. So I, I'm fine with out seeing the playback of how I'm feeling right now. Feeling like that, that what you saw was a mockery? Did you feel yeah, like I'm mockery? just saying right from the very beginning, the very first playback or drama skit, whatever you want to say, I've, I have felt, I've sat here watching the last few of them, and I've actually felt very insulted. Um, because of the dramatization and how it was portrayed, it was almost like a mockery, you know, with the, the way you know the way we smudge. For me, that was, was yeah. I've taken that very personal. that we explain what it is first, and then we play it back, and then we do the story, and then we warm people up, and then I realized that we just did right off the bat, off a very intense kind of skit and conversation, and then, and then we decontextualize our own art form because of timing, and then, and then it will come out that way, and I'm glad you shared that with us. And so I don't mean to disrespect and I don't mean to disrespect our art form either, because I don't want it to be decontextualized, but it is a, a way that we do often expand on. I think what we're also saying is, as the elephant kind of stuff not being named, so we want to get to, let's name it. Name it. Okay. Just to come up with this presentation for people, you know, we had a group of Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars working on it and conflicting through it and going through all these issues. But some of the things that, that that I think we were trying to portray was uh, not centering one group above the other, but, but showing the problems of working together in a mixed uh, teams that we almost always find ourselves in. You know, so actually sort of the things that we as Aboriginal people assumed as being shared knowledge were not. And that, that was a tension part, actually, that we just are so used to doing things in a certain way that we forgot that not everybody else knows the way. So I don't know if I'm going yeah. <clears throat> in my, From my, my perspective, one of the other things we were trying to do here is, is a naming it is not enough. It's mm -hmm. the start of a process. And what is that process? How do we move past it? How do we move forward? The I'm trying to be polite. So, so the <laughs> um, I, th I thought it was super interesting that the word "assume" kept coming up in the play because that, that's actually what I feel like is is the probably the big elephant in the room is the assumption. Um, and I think what would have helped us in the beginning is if we so this is an Aboriginal health research arts-based symposium. And there's a lot of assumptions, I think, on many different levels, but I think also really about the way that we work and who's here. So, and I, I, I think there's a lot of assumption that we're all working in a good way. And I don't personally, speaking for myself, feel, I really don't feel safe enough to like um, make that assumption or, or know that about other people. I, I'm, not, I'm not willing to say that and I, um, I feel like it's, it's unsafe, it, it continues to become more unsafe when we 
continuously assume things. And, it, and when you bring together indigenous and non-indigenous settler, you know, aboriginal, like, I don't know why we just assume that we're all doing good, like, work in a good way. Like, I, I'm not saying we're not all doing important work, but a lot of the conversations this weekend have really concerned me about who's here and the way that things are been, the things that are going. And I feel like there's been a lot of Aboriginal people educating non-Aboriginal people this weekend. And I think that that's, that's, a, that's a really big problem of colonization and racism is having to educate constantly. So I actually don't want to keep talking. Um, I'm, Sam or Tracy, can you say something about that importance? of settler, because I, I don't think it's my, our responsibility to keep talking about this. I, I, I agree, I just, I just whispered to, to, to Sam, I said I knew this was going to fall to Jessica to, to, to articulate, and I really apologize for that. Um, it shouldn't have, because I think there's, there's a lot of conversations, there have been a lot of conversations going on uh, on the side about, um, about a lot of the things that, that you just said about, um, about the assumptions that, that were made, about who's here, maybe who's not here. I think a lot of the conversations have been about um, what is not happening versus kind of what is happening. Um, and, and I think because of that, it has fallen to the average of people in, in, in the room to, to carry a heavy burden. And I think that, uh, that it's not what, ideally that's, that, that is not what um, allied relationships should be about. Um, and I think that's, I was super, super, super thrilled that Krista accepted the invitation to come here. Um, but at the same time, I also felt a little bit of responsibility because I knew that would be part of your role right, to, to, to be here. And you are so fantastic that we just were happy to take that on, right? Um, but I think that's part of what I was trying to say. I didn't articulate it very well, but when I put my leaf up on the, on the tree, it was, you know, be the change you want to see. And I, it was, it, I, I was thinking about that on several levels. You know, one was, yes, we, we are here, we talk about, you know, the, we talk about doing arts-based research, and it's very important to, to, to do that work, right? It's very important to, um, it's very important to do it out there, but, even more important, and, and I think uh, Jessica had spoken, spoken a little bit about this earlier, I think as an ally, it's even more important for us to do the work on the inside. It's not enough for us to be partnering with Aboriginal communities to do the work in Aboriginal communities. As an ally, we need to do that work in ourselves, but we also need to be educating <coughs> our ally colleagues about how to do, how, how to be a good ally. So, so, so I think that um, I think it's that reflective piece that I have felt was really missing from from this weekend. I mean, I know that I know that we've that a lot of the arts-based exercises that that we've been doing have been about reflection, um, but that particular piece, because again, let's let's uh, name the elephant. I mean, less than fifty percent of the people here are mm -hmm. Aboriginal. Right? Um, and a handful are from community. And there are no youth. <laughs> there's, there's Krista, Krista and, and, and Jessica and Kalia. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so it, it just, it feels, it feels unsafe for me as an ally. You know, it feels unsafe for me to be here talking about Aboriginal youth research without having Aboriginal youth in the room. Just, I just want to say, because uh, Sam, I, I, I would like it if you said something too, mm -hmm. um, but the, that allyship has to be consensual. I wrote that on the, the only thing I could write yesterday was the words um, when we were going around because I actually felt uh, um, offended by the music that was, that was going on, not because I'm offended at all by um, what was, somebody told me it was South African music. And it's so amazing and awesome, but I felt like it was appropriative and made to make us feel good about ourselves. There was no context for who are the singers, where are they from, do we have permission to use this music, what's the context, and it, I just felt like we were like, why are we listening to that, to, you know, so I could only write the words ar around here, and it was like this feel-good settler thing, like, I just, 
like it, it told it, and it put me in this, you know, I was like, this is this is what this space is about. This like this eating, this assuming, and this assume also assumed allyship, not consensual allyship, self determined allyship. So I'm gonna and and I, I also don't want this to turn into a white guilt session either. So I think that that reflective piece is immensely important and. Uh, the assumption of alliance is a really dangerous one. Um, and I, I will say I'm gaining so much energy uh, from what we've been through in the last few days, but I'm wondering how I'm taking that back as a settler scholar to do what work exactly. Um, and, and I'm wondering how appropriate that process is for me. Um, and so I think sitting with these tensions is a really important part of what we need to be doing here. And I think. Um, I think that that questioning and then that that responsibility to be very clear and articulate about what our own goals are, each of us, from whatever positionality we find ourselves in in this room, and how we're building those goals in conversation then with each other, but being very clear about what what we're gaining and what we're trying to gain and what we're taking. Yeah, I just want to express my discomfort with um, when I in, was invited, I felt that I was invited in the sense that I had something to offer, but I would never have jumped to being an Aboriginal ally. Do you know what I mean? So maybe, largely because I don't have the knowledge to do that yet, um, I thought I was coming as somebody who had some very um, deep knowledge of a community that has some analogous history. But the other thing I would say is I would, I don't identify with the binary between settler and Aboriginal because I am not, as I see it, as say I'm a first generation person who arrived here under stress um, and, and actually was evicted from my own country and I'm not trying to put that eviction out as you know the credential of the oppressed like I'm seriously not doing that but I don't to me we need to start thinking about a variety of kinds of allies you know maybe um, maybe I maybe it wasn't a, I mean I don't know I, I I offer what I can offer, but I don't. Um, I don't think I assumed that I would know how to be an Aboriginal ally. Nor did I think that I was coming here to do that because I don't have enough knowledge to do that. I mean, had a conversation with some of the Aboriginal scholars that, um, and I'm not speaking for them, but I, from what I took from the conversation, was that we, we all, all of us in this room, took time away from our families and from many things for a pretty exhausting weekend. And, um, and so I, we sort of came with our preconceived notions and agendas of what we might take away from this. And I've been asking this question since I got here. What, what, what will we benefit from? Like, could we just answer that question? Like, what would benefit us from participating in this workshop? And, um, and so in, in, it's been very difficult. I mean, no, no offense, I love each and every one of my group members, but it was a very difficult group to participate in. There was, I, I don't even know what was going on. I, I teach group counseling, and just from a group counseling perspective, I just saw that the group needed time to form and storm and warm and, and get, to the, get to the point. But, but it was very difficult, and it was not a process that, it, where I'm at in my life and today, that was helpful in my work. It's just not something that is going to help me in any work that I do with Aboriginal youth and any work that I do in life. And certainly not in the context of where I'm at in my emotional state of mind, having not had sleep because my son is sick and that kind of stuff. So I, I did not participate in the canoe uh, performance. Um, but I just, and I think that just is like a wider um, question, is that what, what were we brought together here for? I'm still struggling to figure out why I'm here, what I have to offer, to whom I have offered it, and to how we might exchange something to take away from. Um, at this point, I just don't, I've made great connections, but I made them through lunch. So um, I just don't, don't know the point, I guess, of what we're doing. You know, as, as the person whose name was on the email, I went out to most of you at the, at the beginning asking you to come. When we were uh, putting together the idea of this, 
like art people who do arts-based research, it's a pretty tiny group in the country. <coughs> Aboriginal people who do arts-based research might actually fill a small conference room here, small like boardroom. There's not a whole lot of people. There were several other Aboriginal people who were signed up to come and then through illness had to cancel. But I pretty well know everybody who is, uh, or not every single person, but a whole lot of people, Aboriginal people who do arts-based work in the country. And that would be a very small group. And by necessity, most of us work with allies. You know, I know from making that guest list that the vast majority of people, not all, work with Aboriginal people at different parts of the country or in the U.S. Uh, and some of you we, we brought uh, because you work with Indigenous populations in other country and thought that might be something. Uh, I know when I go traveling, you know, we've talked very much here about an Aboriginal uh, way of doing things. I mean, even in this area here in Treaty 4, it's Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Nehiwak, Anishinaabe, and Michif, just in this area here. I go to BC, I don't know a damn thing. I may as well go to Greece. I can't name the people. I don't know their ways. I know it's way different. Even my sense of humor, which is pretty tame for here, doesn't go over so well over there. You know, Randy and I were talking, like, if I go to his house, I gotta start from square one. So just because the government of Canada has labeled us in Aboriginal doesn't mean we're uh, this one solid, you know, cookie, yeah, generic, like superstore yellow label sort of people. And so we, and I don't think it was assumed because we did our homework about the people on the list. Most of you are university people. None of you are youth. Uh, you ain't that young, dear. You know, <laughs> you're, you're grown up now, so you know you're not the youth that I'm working with. But that was that was on purpose. That at this point in in the uh, that that we wanted people who had worked and had experience, some very much dedicated to arts, not so much to with Aboriginal communities. Other very much dedicated to Aboriginal research, use the arts a bit to share that knowledge. Uh, but we wanted to privilege the voice of the youth by starting out on a Friday night with the youth voice, and that's where we saw that coming in. But it wasn't an intention to have uh, community, university, youth, that, that, that wasn't planned. After talking to our community partner, who again, who couldn't be here today because of things, um, we thought about having that about in our process, maybe in about two years down the road or three years to bring together the, our community partners and our youth and have another gathering. But that was never the intent of this. It was about learning things so we can better serve the youth with whom we are working from other people learning from their experience. So if we didn't communicate that well, well we, I mean, I'm the one who sent the damn email. So if I didn't communicate that well, and have left people kind of wondering what the hell are you doing. You know, I apologize for that, but you're a stum bum. I, get, I guess so much of anything like, at this point in my life, I learn more from my, my errors than I do from the things I do right. So we're stumbling along and, and doing a whole lot of the, you know, who should have done this and that. And you know, all I can do is apologize and hopefully learn <coughs> and Next time we try it, we hopefully won't make these mistakes. We'll make other mistakes, because that's the way it works. And that's when you go home to the res, right? And then they don't say, you're, oh, you're a good-looking, handsome man. They don't say that. And it's like, just ugly from pipe butt, you must stink. You know? <laughs> like that kind of stuff, that, that's how we talk when we're out there doing our research and stuff. Because if you actually, as a, I'm only like you address the elephant in the room. This is my territory. I wouldn't say mine. This is where I grew up. Um, grew up inner city too, bouncing back and forth to the reserve. And our conversation is quite well changed from the time I grew up. And growing up saying, at, and, 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 
Holy, <laughs> ishti, you know, falling over. Um, but we, we, growing up in that language, um, suddenly it starts to change. And this is where I get, I get worried about the youth, right? For a simple reason, suddenly they're not using those words. What's up, homie? Doing all this stuff. And what are they adapting to? What are they not sharing? They see our, uh, us older, I say older because I am older now. Um, when I was a youth, I used all those old slang terms from the, the old Indians, what the old Indians used to talk like on the res. Um, now these young kids, they make fun of me because I do this. And they're like, hey, what's up, home? What's up? And then they use the N-word, right? And then now they're starting to adapt themselves to a society that's not even themselves. I see this because, well, you know, I work directly with them. I'm the guy that's on, I'm doing the field work. I'm out there crawling in the weeds, making sure that things are taken care of. Because that's what you have to do sometimes. And so my question, and it was a conversation that I had, not with anybody here, but it was like, why wasn't this on the res? It was like, why couldn't we had this on the res? Just chuck them in the bush and let them go learn what the hell has to happen. But, you know, what anybody would have come. Who would go to the res? That's a question, right? You know, that's, a, that's another thing. But then again, you know, that would be something that we'd have to repair, right? Um, I've seen those young people uh, doing some stuff there. Um, the puppets and whatever, I watched them do it on Thursday. And it's the conversation, the groundwork, the field work. And then I seen that skit that you guys put on there, that playback or whatever. No, I'm going to get myself a new research assistant when somebody's not listening or whatever. Um, to me, it's what, well, those are the people that are out there doing what has to be done. They're making the handshakes, I guess, and they're living the actual experience. Because as an indigenous researcher, scholar, or whatever the hell you want to call me, I'm still just e-guy from Pipe Up. You'll never remove that. I'm still just Nietzsche. I'll still say Nehewak. I say Nietzsche, but you know, Nietzsche doesn't mean what you think it means. A lot of people are like, er, dirty old Nietzsche. They don't say that anymore, right? Like, Nietzsche means Nietzsche mus in our language means sweetheart. You cut that in half, say Nietzsche, that's our friend. That's what we're supposed to say. But anyway, um, that's an aside. But uh, when I come to these, uh, these kinds of things, I realize that um, there's a lot more to do. And I know there's a lot more to do. And this conversation showed up outside when I was talking, having Pete the window that spoke. Um, it's something that we hope will start to actually start to mesh, that we start to actually do things that we're supposed to be doing. Because I can guarantee you there should have been at least 20 other First Nations males sitting here. But they could not get through that first or second year of higher education. Yeah. They could not because they couldn't pass those English 100s. They couldn't pass those math 100s or whatever it is. And even I myself barely getting through the damn master's courses because I have to modify who I am to fit somebody else's agenda. But I will do have to do that because somebody has to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm here. And on top of that, I just, you know, like I said earlier, good hearted people, and you all are, is just, we need more. We need more help in whatever way. And I say we, well, like I said, those young men, and you know, like all us Aboriginal people, we know what young men those are. And I'm trying my best to open any kind of door for them, but you know, it's a, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. It's just the way it is. But yeah, that's reality. So that's what I, my observation is. So don't think that I'm sitting here judging everybody. I don't do that. I'm here to learn. Reflecting back on when I first got that email from you, Joanne, and I was so excited. I was like, oh, a place to talk about these issues. I'm so excited. And I think my first email back was, I'd love to come, but only if I can come with Jessica. Because I was like, I, sh you know, my job is to come with my community partners because we do this work so closely together. And I think, you know, sorry? No, no, sorry. I'm just saying, yeah, that's how I got here. I just said, awesome, that. Yeah, so like, that's my first instinct when I get invited to come to do work, um, to talk about the work we're doing, I always say, can I come with my partner? And I wonder if, um, thinking about that framework of how can we all bring our partners um, so that we're in dyads and we have the support of each other. Like One of the great things is we were able to talk about, because we, we work together so closely, it's a field of safety, and together it's easier to, um, to talk a lot. So anyways, that's one idea. Um, and the other thing is, as a non-Indigenous scholar who's working more and more with indigenous communities over time, um, is figuring out how do 
we also have these conversations on our research teams. Because often, even in our tiny research teams, these are the issues a lot of us are wrestling with on a daily basis. Is what is our role? How do we move forward? How do we deal with the deadlines and the tensions, but also with the really important work in community? And figuring out what is the role of scholarship in community change and development. It's like, you know, a lot of the time, we draft these research proposals to do work that should be program work. Like, mm -hmm. I would say half our proposals should be funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada, mm -hmm. not by CIHR. And we craft these really yeah. elegant proposals to come up with, like, Jessica and I were doing backflips the other night because Jessica has this brilliant idea for programming and she wants to do it. And how are we going to get money for it? Well, she's like, Sarah, please go write a grant to CIHR. And I'm going to do it because that's how I feel like my best role as an ally is, is to create, to find the dollars and create the spaces so that the great working community that's youth led can happen. Um, and I think those of us who are in the, have the privilege of the academy and like years and years of school to help us write these great proposals, like figuring out better ways so that we can get the great ideas from the community and get the dollars there and then figure out how we write about it in ways that honor that and don't take the knowledge out. Yeah. So how do we find ways to write collaboratively about the work that we're doing? How do we think about um, analysis and a framework that honors indigenous knowledge? Like, I think we have real questions we need to be wrestling with and thinking about you know, next steps that really honors those community voices and the incredible work, Krista, that you're doing and other youth are doing in the community already. It's important to say that, and I and I want to I do want to appreciate what you said, Joanne, and I want to appreciate your efforts, and I also want to commit to you that, um, you know, when you were saying, you know, the people who are invited, we like I have a staff we have a staff member who does art space stuff like she pro she should have been here, like, but it's not just your responsibility to do this work, and I want to commit to you that, you know, for a second planning or a gathering, if, if there's a planning committee or something like. It's all of our responsibilities if we want to do this work to bring people here. And I know what it's like to do it in isolation and to do it quickly and all that stuff, but it's it's all of our responsibilities to make the space that we want to see happen. And, you know, there are, I think, you know, to like what our brother was saying here, I'm not in academia, so you wouldn't find me on a, you know, published paper unless Sarah made me do it. Like, <laughs> there's no other, like, they're not going to find, you know, I never even went to university. Like, you're not going to find that. But some of the best researchers I know aren't PhDs. So I think that's, that's the collaborative effort and commitment we have to make that, you know, we have, we have to work together. But like Sarah was saying, bringing people together, but also um, knowing that for future, we have to reconsider who is a researcher. So I think, I think it, it is an important conversation yeah. leading into where we go from here. So I think uh, I will have to stay with it for a while. I just, I mean, picking up on what Jessica said, and I think in all of us think here in terms of all the work you've done to bring everyone together and like how much we appreciate all of that. And then yesterday when some of us were asking for some sort of you know, clear notion of what, what was the outcome, you, you said that you had specific needs that, you know, in terms of putting the group together, like, you know, in terms of the institute. And so part of it is to, to what extent has, has the group met your needs? Has this gathering met your needs? And how can we commit to a further process so that we all take more responsibility? It doesn't fall on you all the time, now that we've come together. And that we can be seen <coughs> as a group of support as opposed to all the work coming from you, which is what happened this time. You know, it's like I meet you, you meet me, and things happen. Like the relationship in itself for me personally is the outcome, mm -hmm. and then cool things come from that. And then a follow up. Well, if the magic happens, it happens. Okay.